Hello and welcome to another episode of Startup Hustle Middle East. Today we have M Kwan with us. He is a content creator, YouTuber extraordinaire. Uh, he just uh, hit a hundred thousand subscribers a few weeks ago. So um, M Kwan's here to tell us about his story, about how he got successful on YouTube. Uh, talk to us about some of his entrepreneurial ventures in the past in the UK. and uh just tell us about how um how i think uh content creators are the future of advertising so uh <laughs> so hey akwan thank you for being on the show thank you very much for having me and that was a a, a really glowing introduction as well so <laughs> thank you very much for that so before akwan can introduce himself i just wanted to let you guys know that akwan was one of my inspirations to start on youtube um You know, when I first started a jarkar, I was looking for influencers to connect with, to um, you know, uh, kind of market my product, get a little bit of PR out there. And when I was doing my research, I came across uh, M Kwan's channel, and um, and I was quite inspired because he's he lives in Abu Dhabi, and uh, and he makes really cool content about. tech Thank and you. cars and and vlogs and i think he's shifted his focus purely to tech now but at yeah. the time i was like oh this is so cool like if he can do it maybe i can give it, give it a shot as well in this region so awesome. yeah i'm quan uh, if you can tell us a little bit about what you do and what made you decide to move to the middle east and and how this whole youtube thing started so yeah um so my online name if you like pseudonym is m quan Uh, my real name is actually Mohsen for those of you that might want to jump on Google and search it uh, save you some time i'm based out here in abu dhabi i'm i consider myself a content creator and sort of internet addict if you want to call it that um i run two youtube channels um one i think you were talking about earlier on was more the vlog lifestyle kind of channel originally uh, which was called m quan vlogs Mm-hmm. and uh, i have another youtube channel which has actually now become my main youtube channel it's just that um it hit 100,000 subscribers a, a, i think a couple of months back so we're at 116,000 now 115,000 and that's primarily around technology and and lifestyle reviews mm-hmm. so um, those are the two channels and I, i i mean i create content on a weekly basis on youtube that's my main sort of platform um so it's technology reviews and boxings occasional vlogs that are related to that kind of genre i cover watches uh i cover cars cars not so much recently just because the amount of work that's required uh, to to kind of film and get those reviews up but i do cover them occasionally and uh, yeah that's the main sort of the main platform that i'm on and then the other platforms are like instagram tiktok twitter um right. snapchat as well yeah how how are you finding tiktok life tiktok is a massive learning curve it's a really interesting learning curve but it it reminds me of where it reminds me of where youtube was when i first started experimenting years and years ago before these channels um mm-hmm. and like we were talking about this briefly as well i used to wear a mask and just kind of like doing really weird stuff on the platform just to understand it tiktok right now gets kind of people take the you know they joke about it and they think it's a platform that's only meant for sort of messing around and dancing but there's a massive element of truth behind that at the moment which is true of what people said about youtube at one point right. that it's only for silly videos and cat videos um but I mean I I've spoken to the guys at TikTok um a couple of times and even my content that I I don't even spend a lot of time on it but I have put up experimented with content around technology like unboxings reviews done really quick behind really cool music or whatever you know the current trendy viral music and the ch- I mean the platform's grown it's got now more followers than it has than my Twitter has for example and I've been on oh, Twitter really? for I think 5 6 years if not longer um and uh, and it's an interesting thing cuz TikTok has a completely different audience right and I think where I see TikTok going is in a sort of a, just a growth phase 
So I think it's one of those things that, you know, you, you can't be brand or you can't be platform loyal. Yeah. Otherwise you will just sink, you know? So you have to experiment. It's fun. It's a different thing to try and experiment with, but yeah, TikTok's yeah, interesting. I see. Um, do you think brands should be experimenting with marketing on TikTok, leveraging totally. TikTokers? Yeah. I think because I see I mean, the numbers yeah. on TikTok, it's insane. Like, like yeah. videos get millions of views. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the short time span of every video, so people can yeah. consume a lot more creators at the uh, you know at a much faster pace versus yeah. like something like YouTube where you have to dedicate like five six minutes at least to a video. And, yeah. um, and but I think the other thing things have changed. So I mean you know. Uh, I used to I, I used to kind of dismiss Snapchat years ago until mm. I came out to the UAE, and then I'd noticed even people in the malls would be playing with the the cat and dog filters, yeah, you know, of various ages. And then you were like, "Oh wow, this has to be something," you know. When in right. Rome, do as the Romans do, that kind of thing. So I was like, oh, "Okay, Snapchat," you know. And I remember telling my friends in the UK at one point that I had Snapchat. And they looked at me like dude, you're not a 15 year old, you know? <laughs> so it's the same thing is now repeated with TikTok that I do see yeah. people kind of like, Oh, that's embarrassing. I'm like, no, it's just tech unboxing on TikTok. Oh, that's really different. Wow. I didn't mm. think of that. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's, I think brand, I think marketing is marketing is, is about, you know, uh, we've heard people like Gary Vee talking about this is where the attention is. Yeah. And if you look at what is on a lot of people's smartphones now, be it iOS or Android, a lot of people have TikTok, so you yeah. must be doing something that, you know, is worth looking into. Yeah, man. I mean, I like consuming TikTok a little bit, like just swiping through it, but I don't know, just not my kind of <laughs> content to create, I guess. I think, look, I mean, I, I, I might be I'm a sure the, for it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the guys at TikTok won't mind me saying this as well, but like, I was very surprised when they reached out to me because they were like, we really like what you're doing here and it's very unusual and it's the kind of it's the kind of content that you know we want to we want to sort of help yeah. um uh, in the region because they said that you know it, it seems like the opinion that tiktok has in the minds of people is that it's a time wasting platform yeah. you know you can't really do anything serious on it uh and uh, and and the funny thing is um I've been sort of looking for other content creators, more sort of serious content creators on TikTok. I found a whole range of, you know, people who like really short, uh, quick um, food videos, for example, on TikTok within mm -hmm. 30 seconds, but like really good well quality done. ones, you know, it's yeah. well done. Yeah. Or it's enough to kind of make you do more research or go and click their links or whatever to find out, um, you know, learning Arabic, for example, there was an account, uh, uh, recently that I, I saw a couple of new words in 15 seconds, you know, with the pronunciation, the meaning, I mean, it's a perfect kind of platform for that, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, that's cool, man. So uh, getting back to your other story about wearing a mask, I know when you yeah. started off YouTube, uh, you were anonymous behind the mask and you were still doing yeah. tech reviews, but that's anonymously. Right. So what is the story with that? So the story is, I mean, I had a, a, a YouTube channel originally that I started off years and years ago. And this was before I came out to the Middle East, before I came out to the UAE. Um, this YouTube channel was started off because at the time I was in a family sort of business. Okay. So we'd started off, I've got two other brothers and my dad is a, a, a doctor. And we started off a business using some of the formulations it was a, a it was a health food company that we started off so it wasn't medicinal products it was in the realm of healthy foods and and, and supplements so to speak mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things was when we started off we had a small grant given to us by the princess trust a very 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 small budget really by today's comparisons i mean i would burn through that in a month you know just <laughs> okay. a couple of things now but like we had to maximize the marketing and the problem that we had at the time was again, YouTube was really associated with cat videos and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And this company was started off 
and you know it was young people that started it off but it was still tied to an older my dad and there were a few other advisors that he had and they were adamant that look we don't want you to market young on these platforms and and until we're a bit more comfortable about it so i think what my dad did was he sent me on a wild goose chase he said to me look you know why didn't you experiment because i he knew that i was into tech and stuff like that. he said why don't you do something yourself with the tech channel you know learn the lessons from that and then come and present your findings to us it was kind of like a very formal sort of thing and and i, I was like okay cool i might as well do that so i set up a a youtube channel and at that time it was all about blackberry okay. and i did a, a lot of research around the first video to put up and it was it was basically getting um bbc iplayer onto BlackBerry's using a hack that was available for iPhones that meant that you didn't have to kind of, at that time, BlackBerry's, you know, you had the BlackBerry Bold, I think you had yeah. a whole bunch of them. So you had to use different software to get the screen size right. But this hack just dealt with it almost okay. on an automatic basis. I put the video up and I kind of left it and didn't expect anything from it. When I went back to it, it had got like, I think 15,000 views. It was wow. on crackberry.com. Your first um, video? my first video yeah it was oh, like damn. it was you know really and it was a three-part video and then uh, i think blackberry reached out a couple of months later and they mm -hmm. said look we want to use this for a development conference or whatever plus uh, we want to give you a free blackberry you know we, we want to sort of collaborate with you and that was like a big deal man yeah and then slowly, you know, I started to get more into it. And, you know, I was looking at the branding, different fonts, what name should I choose? Uh, M Kwan is a nickname that I've had from secondary school. And I kind of just stuck with that. Um, and then slowly as things started developing, one of the things that I was made aware of was people really wanted to know who I was because I never showed my face. So it was always my hands with a product really badly yeah. filmed, you know, <laughs> and, and people would be like, um, he's got such a good British accent, you know, like mm. he, is he from the UK, but he's Brown. It was kind of like a weird thing. Cause obviously yeah. they'd be looking at, you know, small signs. And then, um, somebody said to me, look, you should play with that, play with that kind of idea. So I don't know out of the, out of a really weird place, I decided to put a mask on. Mm -hmm. It was a really scary mask. I think it was an ice hockey mask that I spray painted. And Very it cool. was a weird kind of experiment in, in branding myself. Yeah. Um, and I did it partly because I think at that time, I was a little shy of showing my face and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. But I also, I don't know, because I had this persona offline of being like a, a new startup company CEO, pretty right. much, you know, I was the director of this company. And then I don't know, it, it didn't fit. So I kind of wanted to play with the branding, but also kind of like be anonymous, so anonymous, to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I did that. And uh, it was really weird because it, it pushed the boundaries slightly. If you had looked at me and some of the videos are available online, they're quite hilarious when I look back <laughs> at them. Like I come right. across as such a, such a weirdo. <laughs> but then when I start doing the review, it's kind of like, this is really odd because he's acting like a fool, but he's pretty serious when it comes to the reviews. So, right. and, and that just expanded and continued. And then it got to a point where I just decided I need to take the mask off. Maybe it's a time for a new channel. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of did that at that point. Um, by that point I was collaborating with a lot more brands. Mm. Uh, there were a lot more sort of, companies reaching out, you know, everything from case makers, mobile phone uh, case makers to Nokia and the rest of it. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a great lesson in marketing as well, because some of those lessons I then later used on other startup uh, company ideas as well. Okay. Um, for a while, I had another company that I had set up with a friend of mine that was just around web design. Um, okay. But what we did was it was really cheap cheerful using templates essentially mm -hmm. um which are very common now but at that time you had companies that needed a website for example but they didn't want to pay six seven hundred pounds so we would offer that to them for like 200 300 pounds right um we got quite a few different companies doing this i did the same thing so you know <laughs> yeah. my background sure. development so 
so we <laughs> say the same uh, freelance web web design gigs when exactly. the internet was new <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And people would like see these. I remember at that time we'd upsell by giving them a mobile friendly website as well. So they would get a template that would, you know, allow, so you take the phone out. And at, the, at that time, I remember having the, uh, the iPad and like showing them on the iPad and they were just wowed by it. So they were checking on their <laughs> clunky laptop and then seeing it on the iPad, checking it on, I don't know, an Android phone or an iPhone. It was quite impressive just to upsell by an extra, I don't know, a hundred quid or something. Mm. So, I mean, th there's a whole range of different things I was experimenting with. Um, and then I got a call really out of the blue um, from someone that, I, that was working here in the UAE. And he had recommended me for a posi particular position here. And, and, you know, he sort of told his manager, they reached out and they said, look, you know, we want to hire you for coming out to the UAE. And um, it, it was like a no-brainer at that time. I think, I think at that time I was starting and helping to run three companies in total, and all of them were kind of like startup, startup. One of them was semi-established, the web design company, but you know it was still pretty much a startup situation. Right. Um, and then one of the companies we kind of sold. Uh, this is me and my partner at that time uh, that I was working with. It just got really kind of, I don't know, I, I kind of felt like I was drained out. People said to me as well, you're doing YouTube, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing that. You know, yeah. what's going on? And then when I this know, job uh, came... exactly what you mean. <laughs> I mean... Uh, before we uh, move ahead, uh, you said you sold a company. What What is that company about? So the company was uh, uh, to do with to do with vouchers essentially this is at a time when groupon was massive okay um and it was a small website that uh focused in on niche muslim um sort of coupon deals essentially okay. so we would uh go after smaller companies smaller sort of businesses in a local area that dealt with muslim friendly services or products so making sure that they were halal they were okay. muslim friendly in terms of sharia compliant whatever in the uk. Uh, and that was sold in the uk yeah in the okay. uk again it, it's a big deal in the uk yeah here it's kind of um you know it's Adi sort of thing <laughs> but uh it was it was a really interesting experience really i think those did you guys get a lot of traction on years, that? Uh, the, it, it wasn't much traction on the actual website and the company but it got the attention of certain other players in the market and okay. then i think part of the reason that they you know took it on was because of the fact that it was probably seen as perceived competition let's just buy it up and at that time you know yeah. a certain amount of money would have been like oh cool take it off our hands you know that kind of thing <laughs> we can focus on the next thing yeah right so. um did you guys get any pr and stuff out of that because that sounds like an interesting idea and like something like that press might be interested in yeah, there was, I mean, we really didn't at that time. I think that happened closer to the time that I got offered the job here in the UAE as well. So it was kind of okay. like, sign the deals, kind of like hand it over. Let's take the money. You know, you go your <laughs> way, I go my way. Yeah, let's bounce. You know, let's, <laughs> let's spill. One of those things. But um, I got the job out here in the UAE and it was it was such a weird experience because... In some ways, it's, you know, I was, what I was offered in terms of the job just felt like winning the lottery in many ways. You know, the, the, the amount of work at that time, I mean, it was, it was really crazy. I was working crazy hours. Mm -hmm. uh, I really didn't feel like, in hindsight now, when I look back at it, there were a lot of things that I was learning there. Um, but at the time when you're in it, you just wonder like, is this really the entrepreneurial lifestyle? Is this the kind of, <laughs> you know, Alan Sugar uh dragon's den like this is tough man you know yeah um tough, and and so so yeah it, it, it was almost a release for me and then when i came out here i think for about six months or so i i did absolutely nothing except my job you know i was just like completely 110 mm percent -hmm. in it uh, i came out to ras al khayma originally and then that time I was, uh, you know, uh, with my wife and we had a lot of family back home. 
mm-hmm. wanting to know what we're up to, you know, is how is it there? Is it safe? You know, all the kind of preconceived com- misconceptions that people have about the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, and then we started vlogging, uh, essentially. We had uh, uh, Anquan Vlogs was started off at that point. Right. We'd go out, we'd eat, you know, we'd show kind of what it was like living in the U- UAE as, as new expats. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was quite interesting. And then we started, you know, I, I, I still had that kind of uh, desire to review products, cars, whatever it might be. Right. So we started slowly putting that into it. And then it just grew from there then. And that's where the second channel really took off. That's interesting. Yeah. So in my situation, um, like kind of similar, like I wanted to promote my business. So I started looking at like, how are people getting views organically? How can I reach more people without spending a lot of money? Right. So, exactly. um, so then I, I started looking on YouTube to see what is popular here. And of course I came up on like more vlogs and stuff and, and you guys. And I thought, uh, you know, this is an interesting way to reach more people. That's not going to be super expensive for me, but like, obviously there's an audience for it. Right. So uh, that's why I started, I started creating more content about um, living in Dubai and, and uh, how it is to live here, how much it costs to live here. And, um, those kind of things. And because I grew up in Dubai, I kind of have, have a different perspective. Like I've, exactly. I, I have so much life experience living here for so many years. So yeah. I think I was able to bring that, but then again, my, my personal passions started coming into it and I started like reviewing cars and tech and the same kind of thing, you know? So, yeah. yeah. I think YouTube is an interesting place because, you know, people ask me, why did you stop blogging? And, uh, and I, I say this to quite publicly now, I think where we are in 2020 across multiple social media platforms, it's all about the algorithm. Mm-hmm. So one of the, one of the things that I recognized quite quickly was uh, vlogging was going to burn me out mm-hmm. or it was going to kind of make me a jack of all trades and master of absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some absolutely uh, successful bloggers here right. in the Middle East. Um, but there are very, very few. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say Mo Vlogs is probably the only one who's actually made it. If you look at um, worldwide, uh, most vloggers, I mean, if you look at the people that are vlogging now, yeah. it's really just one, you know, it's a very small percentage that actually make it to the position where they're known for that. Um, right. and I, and, and that was one of the reasons why I remember somebody was talking to me and, and they were asking for some smartphone advice because they knew that I, in the past used, used to cover phones. And, and I remember he, he said to me, dude, why the, why, why aren't you doing more of this? Okay. Like you sp- spoke to me for half an hour about tech and I understood it perfectly. He says, right. I really don't feel like blogging is you. You know, he says like, it, it, he says that, you know, it doesn't kind of fit with the person that I know. And I remember at that point thinking to myself, actually, that's a, that's a fair point. Perhaps I need to, I need to niche in into something, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that decision, I mean, I had Mquan um, reviews channel for a number of years, but, I really think it was in the last 24 months, 18 to 24 months when I really just zoned in and essentially stopped vlogging on the other channel um, to focus in on that, that it's developed that niche. Now, if you'd asked somebody, let's say three years ago, Mquan, what do you, what are the words that you associate with Mquan? It would have been vlogger, Dubai, Mm -hmm. expat, that kind of stuff. Um, But now I hope most people would say tech reviews, yeah. watches, which is perfectly fine for me, or all fits into that. Right. So I think it's really important. Um, and, you know, I, I know that your podcast is around uh, startups, the hustle mm-hmm. culture. I think it's really, really important. Even talking to you now about some of the experiences that I had in the past, one of the things that I feel incredibly passionate about now is, is that you have to drown out the noise, figure out your niche, and really drill down on that because yeah. in this day and age it's so easy to get sucked in to the multiple platforms yeah um and experiment with everything but if you're doing everything then you're just it's just like the rest of the wave you know yeah like, there think, is nothing that sets you apart 
So I think that's a mistake that I made personally on my YouTube channel. Um, it's that I have too many verticals. Like I talk about, yeah. I do vlogs, I do tech, I do cars. Like it's like kind of all over the place. And like people subscribe to me for different reasons. And then when like the YouTube algorithm sees that, oh, okay, this person subscribed, but they haven't watched any of his videos for the last like month because, you know, then they stop recommending your video and then your views dry up. Yeah. So um, I realized that and I, and I see the value of niching down. So like that's why when we started Startup Hustle Middle East, we kind of wanted to keep it focused uh, mainly on entrepreneurship. And I think, uh, and, and, you know, people um, who are, you know, doing something, creating something, uh, whether it be products or YouTube channels or, or, you know, around this space of, uh, of, of, of creating things and, um, and sharing that information. So we thought that, you know, if we keep it niche, uh, first of all, the kind of, the, the monetization aspects of it increase because uh, like as an advertiser, you know that, okay, everybody who's listening to this podcast or every pot potential person who's watching this video is probably interested in this kind of thing, you know? So, so for example, somebody wanted to, uh, you know, advertise on your channel, they know people love tech, they, they come to MQuant. So, yeah. uh, or people love watches. I think the, I, the, the important thing here is like, on the one hand, sometimes I kind of wish like I could just talk about other stuff as well because I'm not only into tech, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not just this one mono kind of character. Um, mm -hmm. To the point where some, to the point where, being totally honest, I, I tweet and then I have to take down those tweets because they're either political or they're kind of slightly too spiritual, okay. or they can kind of not, they don't fit into the overall branding element of what Mquan as a brand is and has become. Okay. Uh, and sometimes I do that myself, and other times, you know, because uh, I'm part of an agency, they they will remind me. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> stick to stick to the subject, you know, and I'm grateful for that for, for, um, for that from them because I think it's really important to do that. The downside of that is that you do start to feel kind of like you you, you can start to feel boxed in. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important to figure out why you're doing it and what you're going to do. I mean, talking about the why is really important because if it's a hobby for you. Mm -hmm. You know, had I not done the vlogging and had I not done like cars and, and, you know, experimenting with watches and this, that, the other, I wouldn't know where my niche would be. I wouldn't know what kind of seems to work, yeah. you know? So it's perfectly fine to do that. But I think there does come a point at which you have to figure out if you're doing it purely because you just enjoy the creative element of, you know, filming, editing, putting it out there. Yeah. That's perfectly fine. You can you can do whatever you want. I think it is important to do stuff that makes you happy. Yeah. Um, but it, I feel like the algorithms across the platforms have got to a stage now where they will reward the niche them. I mean, yeah. the, if you niche in, that's going to be an automatic kind of situation where you'll win. Yeah, I think it's more about like people know what to expect, right? Uh, yeah. if you're throwing them curveballs left, right, and center with your content, it's difficult to keep their attention. Yeah. So let's talk about something that might be interesting to our um, listeners is about how uh, entrepreneurs can potentially leverage social media for you know growing their brands or or spreading the word about their product. Uh, do you, what do you think about that being on the other side, on the content creation side? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think brands, especially for startups now, I think it's really important for them to, to explore what they're already doing, which is spending time on social media platforms, mm -hmm. figuring out, you know, what social media platforms are relevant in the market that they're aiming to right. either sell in or market in or whatever it might be. And also think about what is relevant in the region. So for example, I mean, when I first got here, Snapchat in, in the UK, in my circle of friends, Snapchat was associated essentially with 15 year olds 
or guys who are looking for basically something on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, but here in this market, I mean, it, Snapchat is taken in a completely different light. It's a much more serious platform to the point that even now, my engage, my content that I put out on Snapchat is pretty much copy and paste from Instagram, which right. isn't the best thing to do, but it, I do that. Um, but still here amongst, let's say, local Emiratis, mm-hmm. Snapchat is phenomenal. Like it's still... Yeah a great platform to focus on TikTok, like we were talking about earlier on yeah. gives you an access to let's say um, a certain demographic those that come from the uh, indian subcontinent in the, uh, india pakistan bangladesh not only that but also a demographic which tends to be younger that comes from let's say the us or even europe mm-hmm. um so that might be a platform to explore and consider over there and I think, especially on a startup level, I, I'm just thinking back to, you know, some of the experiences that I had. Mm-hmm. Time is of an absolute essence. And I think one of the problems with, one of the problems with when you're starting up is trying to deal with the fact that you only have a certain amount of time to do the basic stuff that needs to keep your project running. Right. Uh, you know, dealing with clients, making money, the whole paperwork shebang and the rest of it um but also being able to market at the same time so you have to be really strict with that time Mm -hmm. um and i remember when we started off originally the family business uh with my brothers we would actually have two hours in the day when collectively we were doing stuff on social media so if that meant just researching hashtags Mm -hmm. responding to people um you know just kind of interacting with people, following people, unfollowing people, um, Mm -hmm. you know, engaging in conversations without being too kind of, Hey, check our product out, but just like, you know, responding to a comment. Oh, that's Mm -hmm. trying to get like an organic conversation going. I think entrepreneurs should consider that. Um, and then, you know, social media has changed a great deal. So documenting is incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. I know in this part of the world, uh, there's a kind of, it's very, uh, there's a slight, I don't know if it's a, a negative, but it's not perceived in the most positive light when you are honest and candid about documenting your journey, particularly your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. But I think things are changing and I think people can respect and admire more of the honesty, particularly when you just turn on your camera without the need of hiring someone else yeah. to do the filming for you. You don't need a glossy video, for example. And just yeah. saying, look, we've got this new product out. This is the rough procedure process. I'm going to take you on a vlog with me now. and I'll show you the issues that I have with the printer, with the designer, mm-hmm. with, you know, the, the, I don't know, the painter or whoever. Yeah. Um, and that can be incredibly empowering. And the thing is, social media is a great narrative tool. Yes. Um, and that is something that you must remember as an entrepreneur, as a startup, that you essentially have a loudspeaker and the skill here is to put out a convincing enough narrative. Yeah. And for that, you don't need to gloss it over. You can be completely honest and say, look, this is our journey. We'd love yeah. for you to come and join us on our journey. In fact, um, I think that works better versus the glossy thing, you know, because people completely. see through um, this uh, facade. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I think when you're real, uh, people connect with that more. Um, in fact, today I was listening to an interview um, on another podcast uh, about the founder of Fitbit and like how they started Fitbit and like how they launched it at TechCrunch and uh, with a prototype. And then they received, like they were expecting about 50 pre-orders for it. This is the first Fitbit that ever came out. And they received like 2,000 uh, you know, uh, pre-orders for it. And then eventually it came up to 25,000 pre-orders before they had even prototyped the product, like the final product. But he was like, uh, then what we started doing is blogging about the process and keeping all our pre-orders, uh, all the people who pre-ordered informed. And they were one of the first companies to do that. Uh, now it's quite common. You see a lot of Indiegogos and like, yeah. You know these uh, Kickstarters and stuff, blogging about their progress. But that was pretty an innovative then, and that kept the yeah. Fitbit community hooked. And then when they finally launched, like people were so excited about it because they they knew the whole journey of the product. So that yeah. was. Uh, that, I mean, that's a 
that's a great example. That's, you know, essentially, uh, it, it, there's an element of um, a human touch. Social media, and this is, you know, I've had this discussion with other people before. I did a podcast with Esquire magazine, and they asked me, they said, why is it that, let's say, uh, when it comes to tech, why is it that a publication like GQ or Esquire magazine will never get the amount of hits or views never, as yeah. MKBHD or MQAR? And I said, the reason is that social media is the first hint is in the social element. There has to be a personable element to it. To the point where, and I'm not sure how many of your uh, listeners or you know, uh, people that are listening to this at the moment mm-hmm. will have seen my channel. One of the things that gets criticized on my channel is dude you need to invest in a better camera <laughs> like what is this shaky business i do that on purpose okay because i like i with all the respect that i have for someone like mkbhd or anybody else yeah. his content is great but the thing is when your when your video quality is so you know glossy and perfect yeah there's a fine line, and I, I believe this because I do this all the time. If there is a review that I'm checking out for a product, i much rather the dude that's filming with one hand. <laughs> well, guys, just give me a second. Let me open this out. Because there's, there's an element of truth behind that. There's an element of right. kind of, it feels much more genuine, you know? So long as, you know, it's viewable and I can hear the sounds and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> so there's a reason why I might not use a tripod, even though I've got like three tripods lying around. Because I, I want oh, it to be you know, an element of truth to the point that, you know, when I purchased the, before this, I was using like the Canon G7X for a tech review channel, which is right. people say to me, like I, I turn up to events and everyone's got their like, you know, A7 and the rest of it. <laughs> I pull out this Canon G7X Mark II or Mark III and people are like, dude, are you for real? I'm like, yeah. Like, <laughs> dude, but honestly, it's a, it's a brilliant camera. I think for the first two years of YouTube, I just used a yeah. G7X. It's just a great G7X camera. is, 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 is remarkable. But here's the interesting thing now. Like I've done a couple of videos that I filmed entirely on the iPhone. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was one video that I filmed on, was it on the, the iPhone I've 11 done, Pro? Has better video. The 11 Pro. The G7X. Yeah. Is, ins- is insane. Like it's... <laughs> But here's the thing, like most entrepreneurs, most people who are starting up in business, these are the ways that you can cut down. Yeah. You buy your phone, which is expensive, but you know, you're going to buy it anyway. Yeah. Um, you download, let's say, iMovie for absolutely free. You film. Yeah. You cut. You edit all on this thing. Like it's insane. And if yeah. you're an Android user, even the P40 Pro or, you know, let's say, I don't know, the Samsung Galaxy S20. Yeah, like the the video quality is just as good. You just film. If you don't want to edit, you don't have time to edit. Just yeah. literally do one take, upload sort of thing. You know. Yeah. Um, um, so there's that. This, by the way, there was another thing that I wanted to talk about from my personal experience with the jar car. So we were um, so a jar car. If you don't know, uh, I think you probably don't know, but a jar car is a car rental mm-hmm. um, platform. So we're a marketplace. We allow small to medium-sized car rental companies to go online. Basically, we provide them with the booking engine uh, where they can register their cars and then we, we put it on a jar car as a marketplace. So uh, we were trying to recruit more people to come on the platform, right? So we, we sent them emailers. We sent them like nice fancy PDFs. We had like a YouTube video where like it went through the whole back-end process of how to register how how to do all this stuff but we got very very little response from any of those Mm -hmm. you know try uh, types of mediums then i recorded one video where it was me talking to a camera like this and explaining what a jar car is and just talking about what we're trying to do and how it's going to benefit them and how it's going to benefit us and there was like a 300% increase in the amount of responses we got on that one video versus all the previous marketing that we did. So I think, you know, having that personal touch really does yeah. make a difference. Yeah, it makes a massive difference. It's, it's, it's insane. I, I feel really upset and sad sometimes <laughs> when like I get an email come in, you know, and I don't even look at it. I just, it, cause I, I, I can, I can see from the heading and I can see from just the, the first line that That it's basically (laughs) it's spam and it's just wipe goodbye you know gotta keep that inbox 
inbox at zero, you know. So, <laughs> so unless it's really yeah. important, I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think email has become very poor just because of the amount of noise on that platform. It's just, it's just, yeah. it's a great way to communicate and keep in touch with yeah. teams and stuff like that. But it's not a very good way to market. I don't think anymore. Yeah, Even I though agree. it's super cheap to market with email, but it's not very effective. I don't think. Yeah. I think the only way it's effective is if is you're trying to re-reach a customer who is booked from you before or something like that. But even then, like our conversion rate on emails has been pretty low. So last thing before we wind this up, I just want to ask you, what do you think about brands reaching out to influencers and content creators such as yourself to, to market themselves? I, I think... Uh, and, and also, how look, do you think it's different from traditional advertising? Uh, look, I think at the moment, this is a really weird, great area. Um, as someone who is a content creator, Mm -hmm. I've seen, uh, particularly in the UAE, I've seen a massive sort of dislike for influencers. Here's the weird thing. I don't consider myself to be an influencer. Okay. Um, like even when people refer to me as an influencer, I, I try and kind of just remind them I'm a content creator. The word influencer is so heavy with a, a ton of baggage. Like it's yeah. even before the negative connotations that it's kind of conjured up in the mind. Influencer, just just by the mere word influencer, it sort of gives you the, uh, the the impression that that person has some kind of level of influence. And the, the truth and reality is we're all influencers because if you buy a good product, you tell your mother about it, yeah. and you suddenly become an influencer. I mean, in, it, to the core, if we're going to get into like the, the word definition. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in this market, one of the things that I've noticed is there's a massive amount of dislike mistrust almost like a professional uh just absolute hate towards influencers yeah um part of that in my view is coming from people or individuals that hate the fact that there might be influencers who who are doing better than them and do it part time <laughs> let's say and that's the truth that is the truth uh you know you have let's say a tech journalist who spent what five, six years, ten years of their lives working for multiple publications, um, but has never built up their own personal brand, never been right. allowed to, never built that up. Here comes someone that does it part time as a hobby mm -hmm. and gets much more traction than they do, to the right. point where brands are now skipping the publication and going straight to a YouTuber or a content creator or an influencer to give them hands-on with a smartphone before it's launched to the main media. Right. That's a horrible feeling. Like who the F is this dude? Like he doesn't know a thing about, you know, like what's up with his hair? What's up with this? What's up with that? <laughs> so I think, I think there's an, there is an element of that, which I don't like because the truth is at the end of the day, like we're all in this hustle together. Right if you really feel that you have better qualifications and better capabilities, prove it. it's a free market, set up your own YouTube channel and realize just how hard it is to do that. Yeah. There is another group, you know, of, of people that completely dislike influencers because influencers have acted like absolute idiots. <laughs> so, you know, they, they'll be the type of people that will send, you know, messages to a restaurant, you know, you're going to invite us, you're going to, you, you know, we're not going to pay for the food. We're going to give you free coverage, yada, yada, yada. I mean, right. I, I can say in some of those situations, some of those scenarios, it's a fair kind of dig to have an influences. Right. But I think the important thing to recognize for a startup and for a company is that content creators, influencers are definitely uh, people at the moment that have some level of, um, you know, influence uh, reach. to use a reach, you know, yeah. uh, over a certain audience. And I think right. what brands and agencies need to do is that they need to be selective in that. Right. I think over 2019 and I think in 2020 now as well, we're getting more and more brands who are less interested in advertising, working, collaborating with guys with multi million followers Mm -hmm. and focusing on people with a niche now yeah. because they recognize that sometimes you know you can have 
five to 10 million, let's say, subscribers, but the, the, the numbers don't really matter if it doesn't fit with the demographic of your desired, you know, yes. um, customer base. So in those cases, I think, especially coming back to startups, you know, you, you've got limited resources. Think about the people that you already consume content from mm-hmm. that you kind of know that you kind of have seen and trust on your social media feeds, yeah. reach out to them and, and sort of open a dialogue, see what it is that you can offer them, what it is that they're asking for. I mean, I think on one hand here in the UAE, some of the, some of the pricing that content creators charge mm-hmm. uh, is very, very little compared to massive publications that you would pay, you know, I agree. sometimes double, triple, you know, yeah. I mean, you've done this already, you know, I mean, th- yeah. that's sometimes like I have, I have these discussions with agencies or brands that approach me and they say that we're, we're not sure this, that, the other. I told them, look, you know, go away, you do your research. You know, I shouldn't be doing your research for you. You should be doing your own research. What I'm offering you is X, Y, Z. Mm-hmm. And then you can break down what the perceived ROI might be. Right. Um, you know, if you're publicizing in a said magazine, how many times is that said magazine, A, going to be read from cover to cover. Right. And B, how many, you know, or what's the total reach that it's going to mm-hmm. give you? Forget about impressions for a moment but the total yeah. reach, how many people are actually going to engage in that article or that, you know, pub- the adverts of yours that you're going to put in that publication and compare it with what you're being offered online. I think in some ways, what content creators in this part of the world, particularly niche content creators. So I'm talking about the guys that haven't got millions and millions of subscribers. Yeah. Um, what they're offering is quite competitive. Some yeah. influencers, content creators will take your stuff for free and then we'll give an output. And again, you have to decide whether or not that's worth it. Yeah. Um, others uh, might charge you and, and you need to take that on a, on a case by case basis, but it's definitely worth considering. Yeah. Yeah. So in my experience, I worked with uh, maybe 10 or 15 different influencers for a jar car. And Every time we've gone with traditional media versus influencers. And the thing is with influencers, a lot of the times, because of me being on YouTube as well, it generally uh, ends up being a barter deal for me where I give them a free car for a day, a nice car maybe. And, um, And in return, they'll make a video for me. That gives me video content that I can use for a jar car, for my Instagram, for my Facebook for creating a blog post um you know it, it it gives me reach to their audience it might be tens of thousands of people hundreds of thousands of people potentially every time we've done a influencer campaign of any kind I, I wouldn't even call it a campaign it's just like a friend doing me a favor uh yeah. it's resulted in my website hits going through the roof uh people searching more for my brand on google um, you know, so as compared to like, we've tried magazines, we've tried a little bit of radio, um, even Google search, it's extremely important for us. Cause I mean, that's, uh, but the amount of money that you spend for Google search, usually the ROI on it doesn't make sense. You know, uh, yeah. it's more of uh, just to get your foot, uh, in the door, kind of get the ball rolling uh-huh. kind of thing. Uh, but if you look at it long term, unless you have crazy lifetime value on your deals uh, on each transaction, um, generally Google's not going to make sense for your business. Uh, I think a lot of people, a lot, a lot of entrepreneurs think, oh, I'm going to create my product. I'm going to buy a bunch of Google AdWords and, uh, and that, that equation is going to make sense. But it usually doesn't work that way. So... Yeah. Um, and there's a, and the other point is, I mean, like, you know, major brands, you know, will work with influencers, mm-hmm. uh, regardless what you hear on Twitter or anywhere else. I mean, major, major brands we're talking, I mean, in, in the tech field, look at yeah. Huawei. I mean, who doesn't, who yeah. doesn't promote a Huawei product, you know, people yeah. who, who not even in the tech, uh, you know, arena or area are yeah. sort of um, being paid to promote Huawei products. You look at what Apple does, where they put their products in yeah. 
whose hands they're putting their AirPods or, you know, the Apple Watch and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, so major brands are doing this already. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of a little ignorant and arrogant in some ways to kind of dismiss influencer marketing completely based on, you know, sort of other people's bad experience. I think yeah. you have to, you have to do your research, even people that I, for example, I get asked to do podcasts, right? I mean, mm. I have to select the people that I'm going to be giving my time to. Like, oh, I, thank you. I genuinely, thank you I, no, I mean, like, it's, <laughs> it's one of those things. Cause I, I've known you, you, you know, we've spoken about this for a while. I've listened to some of your stuff. Yeah. You know, I've, I've seen your videos, uh, your YouTube videos online as well. So for me, like it, it's, I, I've done my own research. So I'm not spending any money doing this, but if I was to spend money or was to give products away, I think mm -hmm. you'd be foolish just to assume just because somebody else recommended somebody else as an influencer to collaborate yeah. with. You have to do your own research, you know, you have to do yeah. that. I agree. Yeah. And, uh, and we worked with some influencers before that didn't really fit our niche and that didn't work so well, you know? So yeah. uh, you really need to, like, for us, for example, if they're car influencers, then that's going to work better than if I work with a tech influencer, right? So, yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes I might just do it because uh, I have the resources to do it and I'm just, you know, using it for word of mouth or whatever. Yeah. But, um, but overall, is this obviously, your... this... Huh? Is this your subtle way of asking me? <laughs> <laughs> hey man, if you ever want a car from a jar car, let me know once before. Which thing, I know. Uh, I know, man. <laughs> <laughs> Inshallah. I'm sure we will, man. All right, cool. Yeah. So before we end this podcast, I just wanted to ask you, we ask all our guests, if you had any piece of advice for anybody entrepreneurs, what yeah. would it be? Oh, I think... Uh, right now what i feel is so important is is learn to be patient like it's like patience is so important in any field mm -hmm. um and i think part of the problem particularly as somebody who's online and i'm sure you know many other people are also online connected or online there's this element of go 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 you got to get it done now 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 yesterday yesterday but mm -hmm. just be patient with the whole journey um, because patience will give you that breathing space. It will give you the ability to think, the ability to, you know, think in a rational way, in a sensible way, in a, you know, in a sustainable way as well. So just patience is really important. Yeah. Absolutely agree, man. Thank you for being on the show. Um, Thank you very much, man. So uh, this sorry podcast... it's taken so long, man. Sorry it's <laughs> taken so long. <laughs> no worries, man. At least we got you on the show finally. Yeah. So um, this, by the way, this podcast is available on all the podcast platforms. So if you guys want to hear it on uh, Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, it's available everywhere. Uh, we also do have a video version of this on YouTube. So if you guys want to go check that out, I leave a link in the description. Uh, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform because that helps us spread the word and uh, we will see you in the next episode. Keep on awesome.